In this video, I'm going to share three of Warren Buffett's highest paying dividend stocks. Warren Buffett holds a sizable stake in these companies that pay dividends as high as 5%. So the first big question is why is Warren Buffett invested in these high dividend stocks? I'm going to walk you through his historical and current position in these companies and build a thesis for why he's invested in them. The second big question is are these dividend stocks a good buy right now? And I'm going to walk you through different dividend metrics to assess the quality of the dividend as well as briefly touch upon their valuations. As always, I am not a financial advisor and I am not making any recommendations specific for your situation. You need to be aware of the risks and do your own independent research and thorough due diligence before making any investment decisions. The first high dividend stock owned by Warren Buffett is Store Capital, ticker symbol STOR. Store Capital is one of the largest and fastest growing net lease REITs in the US with a diversified portfolio of 2,634 properties and 519 tenants across 49 states. Its tenants generally operate in one of three categories. First are service providers such as early childhood education, premier health clubs, movie theaters. Second are Amazon resistant retailers like furniture stores, used car dealerships, or stores that specialize in outdoor activities and recreation. The last category is manufacturers involved in food processing, metal fabrication, and plastic and rubber products and such. On the surface, there's nothing special about store capital compared to other REITs, but it happens to be the one and only REIT Warren Buffett owns in Berkshire Hathaway's $270 billion portfolio. It's safe to say Warren Buffett rarely invests in REITs, so why does he own store capital? I wanna share two things that this REIT does differently than its peers, which might explain why Warren Buffett likes it a lot. So much so that as of the end of 2020, he owns 9.2% of the company. It's one of only 13 companies in which he has an ownership stake greater than 9%. One of store capital's secret sauce is focusing on what it calls unit level profitability as an essential payment source. Virtually all other REITs focus on only two payment sources. First being the credit worthiness of the tenant, as in does the tenant have the ability to make rent payments and do they have a history demonstrating such. The second payment source is the value of the property. REITs grow their value by buying and holding real estate that appreciates in value over time. But store capital considers unit level profitability the third payment source essential to its success. The company focuses on owning and leasing out profit center properties. The business tenant must demonstrate the property it rents from store capital generates profits for the tenant at that specific specific location. By adding this information into its own proprietary EDF model or expected default frequency, the company estimates its median portfolio credit rating improves by three levels compared to Moody's standard EDF model. In plain English, knowing this about their tenants significantly improves the quality of its portfolio. But how does store capital know the profitability of a specific unit? In its lease contracts, the company requires its tenants to provide the unit level financial reports. This along with these other minimum requirements makes store capital very select in where it invests and the tenants it targets because many businesses are unwilling to provide unit level financial reporting. So how does this REIT pull it off? This leads to the second secret sauce. Store Capital targets the 200,000 companies in what is called the middle market. These are loosely defined as companies with revenue between 10 million to $1 billion. And the key part is this. These companies are often non-rated with limited real estate capital financing options. This is because they're not considered investment grade by big banks and they generally avoid serving this market due to heavy regulation. So middle market companies need store capital and store capital in turn can be selective, which gives the REIT a stronger position to negotiate favorable terms like longer leases, passing the property expenses to the tenants using triple net leases and requiring unit level financial reporting. Here you can see that store capital's leverage and negotiations allows it to get more favorable terms in its leases compared to the industry such as the highest spread between lease yield and borrowing costs and the top quartile in lease escalation clauses. Looking at its dividend, it currently offers a 4% yield and while that is on the lower end for REITs in general, its dividend growth has been very strong at 5.9% annually over the past five years since its IPO in 2014. In an older version of this, from the Q3 earnings presentation, store's dividend growth is 10% higher than its nearest competitor, 10% higher. That is a solid performance above its peers. Flipping back to the Q4 slide, its payout ratio has been consistently lower than its peers, hovering around 70% prior to COVID. Now I had mentioned that Warren Buffett has a 9% ownership in store capital, but he built that stake in two tranches. His initial stake was back in June 2017 when he brought 18.6 million shares. Back then, the shares were worth around $22. His second purchase was 5.8 million shares revealed in the June 2020 13F filing at a share price of around $20 just after the price bottomed out near the end of March. 
Since then, the stock has increased around 150%. So then we need to ask ourselves, is store capital still worth buying at today's price of around $35? Right now, the company is trading at a forward price to adjusted FFO of 18.5. Its nearest competitors, Realty Income, National Retail Properties, and Spirit Realty are trading at about 20, 16.7, and 15 respectively. When we step back and look at their REIT sector overall, we want to look at the standardized price to FFO and store capital stands at 19 while the sector stands at 18. So based on these multiples, I consider store capital to be fairly valued at this point. It's certainly not the bargain it was at this time last year. If you're interested in store capital or any of the next dividend stocks, invest on Webull and get two free stocks worth up to $1,850 just by opening an account and depositing $100. Webull is an online trading platform that is commission free, no minimum deposit deposits, there's no cost to use the basic service. So you get free money just by signing up and making a deposit. So claim your free stock now by using the link in the description and by doing so, you also help support this channel, so thank you. The next company is Verizon, ticker symbol VZ. I don't think this company needs an introduction, but what many don't realize is just how massive this telecom company is. With $237 billion in market cap, it ranks as the 23rd largest company in the S&P 500. So when Warren Buffett bought a seemingly small 3.5% stake in the company late last year, it ended up being a staggering $8.6 billion investment, ranking it as a sixth largest holding in Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio. But this isn't his first rodeo with this company. Back in late 2013, he bought a $524 million stake in it. He increased his position by 40% to $734 million in 2014, maintained that for about two years, and they sold everything by the end of 2015. And Verizon's stock price didn't really move much during that time frame. So why is Warren Buffett back on board with a position more than 10 10 times larger than before. I want to propose two reasons. First, Verizon helps solve Warren Buffett's $138 billion problem. It's a cheap blue chip company in a very overvalued market, much more expensive than back in 2014. So how overvalued is the market today? One popular valuation metric called the Buffett Indicator currently stands at 234%, which is a staggering 88% higher than the long-term trend line. For some perspective, it has never been this high going back as far as 1950. Based on a trailing 12-month PE ratio, another popular metric, the S&P 500 currently stands at 42. The ratio has been this high only twice, going back to 1880, first around the dot-com bubble and the, at the start of the Great Recession in 2008-2009. By that same measure, Verizon is currently at a ratio of 12.5. 12.5! That's dirt cheap compared to the broader market. And so you can see why Warren Buffett likes Verizon. It's an attractive valuation for a stable company with a high barrier to entry in a predictable industry. But more importantly, Verizon's massive market cap helps alleviate his excessive cash position. Few companies can handle an $8.6 billion share purchase in a single quarter without drawing attention. And that's still a fraction of his cash. In fact, Warren Buffett ended 2020 with $138 billion in cash. He had $146 billion on hand in Q3, which means the Verizon purchase alone drew down 6% of it. The second reason why I think he bought Verizon is because of 5G. The 5G services market size is estimated to be worth $665 billion by 2028, with the US market size anticipated to reach $148 billion. The race to dominate the next generation in wireless connectivity is heating up between T-Mobile, AT&T, and Verizon, and Verizon is his biggest bet. However, industry experts would agree that in the aftermath of the pivotal FCC C-band auctions earlier this year, T-Mobile remains the leader in the 5G race, even though Verizon paid a record $53 billion to secure new wireless spectrum for 5G. You can see in this chart, the red bars are the spectrums each company won in the auction. Verizon and AT&T were far behind in the low to mid spectrum holdings prior to the auction, and they desperately needed the C-bands just to catch up with T-Mobile. Now, if you're a bit lost, let me try to explain in plain English what these spectrum ownerships have to do with 5G and what it means for Verizon. 5G can work in three different spectrum bands. This chart shows you different bands and how far they can reach from the originating tower or transmitter represented by this dot. Millimeter wave or high band 5G is right at the dot or basically near the source. It is by far the fastest 5G spectrum, but it doesn't get far, so you have to be really close to towers or transmitters. Now Verizon dominates the spectrum band as shown here, 
but it's not useful without a ton of short range transmitters. It's not economical outside of densely populated areas. Low band 5G is a slow spectrum. It's actually 600 megahertz and lower, so it extends beyond what this chart shows. It's only a fraction faster than 5G depending on different factors, but the signal can travel really, really far from the signal tower. Then there's a mid band between 700 megahertz to 6 gigahertz, which is a sweet spot that all the carriers need to have because it offers the best trade-off between speed and distance. Now C-bands are a range of spectrum within the mid-band that were not available to the carriers until the FCC auction. They are owned by satellite companies like Intel Stat or SES for TV and radio services, so the auction basically transferred the rights to the telecom companies. Prior to the auction, T-Mobile dominated the available mid-band spectrum holdings because of its merger with Sprint. So T-Mobile has been able to roll out 5G faster and more easily because the thing is, even though Verizon and AT&T now own the C-bands, those spectrums aren't available yet until the end of 2021 at the earliest because the satellite companies have until then to transition off those spectrums. So not only is Verizon behind T-Mobile in rolling out 5G, but because it has less spectrum holdings as seen here, its network capacity and speed won't be on par with T-Mobile because of the amount of spectrum each company owns. And AT&T is definitely behind both in that regard. So why didn't Warren Buffett buy T-Mobile instead of Verizon? Well, he does own T-Mobile, but his stake in it is only 0.4% valued at 700 million, which he bought sometime in Q2 of 2020. His Verizon stake is more than 12 times larger, and I would argue it comes down to valuations. Right now, T-Mobile's stock price is trading at a trailing 12-month PE multiple of 56. It's 33% more expensive than the broader S&P 500, versus Verizon, which is again at 12.5. So yeah, in a classic Warren Buffett move, he doesn't want to overpay for his bet on 5 G. Verizon just released its Q1 2021 results and it generated $5.2 billion in free cash flow, paid $2.6 billion in dividends, giving us a payout ratio of 50% which is safe. But if you decide to buy Verizon, you want to keep an eye out on the debt to EBITDA ratio. It's increased closer to 3 obviously because of the C-band auction and that was just to acquire the spectrums. This slide shows the C-band build out for 5G is expected to increase capex by 2 to 3 billion dollars. And with service revenue expected to barely grow at 2% which makes up 85% of total revenue, that is going to put pressure on free cash so it's something you should keep an eye on. The company pays a 4.4% dividend right now but its dividend hasn't grown much in the last 10 years, and I don't think it will in the next year or two as it invests heavily in 5G. The next company is Chevron, ticker symbol CVX. Warren Buffett first bought Chevron in Q3 of 2020, where he filed confidentially with the SEC to hide his position, and then he purchased another $5.3 billion stake in Q4. So as of the end of 2020, he owns 2.5% of the company worth $4.9 billion. And it was really good timing because assuming his weighted average purchase price was around $73, right now the stock is just north of $100, so he made a gain of around 40% year to date or about $1.4 billion. And this shouldn't come as a surprise. Oil prices have now rebounded to above $60 per barrel since falling to as low as $19 last April. But I think the key takeaway from his Chevron investment has to do with more than just this one company. In fact, Warren Buffett has been very active in the energy sector as of late. In 2019, he invested $10 billion in Occidental Petroleum in exchange for preferred stocks that have an annual dividend of 8%. In 2020, he bought Dominion Energy's natural gas transmission and storage assets worth $10 billion. With this acquisition, Berkshire Hathaway carries 18% of interstate natural gas transmission in the US, and these are just his direct investments. In August 2020, Warren Buffett invested more than $6 billion in five of Japan's biggest trading companies that have direct stakes in oil and gas operations. For example, he invested in Mitsuiko and Mitsubishi, which have joint stakes in Sampra Energy's Cameron LNG, or liquefied natural gas, export terminal in Louisiana. He also invested in Sumitomo Corp, which has a direct stake in the Cove Point LNG shipping terminal in Maryland. Altogether, he's invested around $31 billion directly and indirectly into oil and natural gas interests. With all the hype around EVs, renewable energies, carbon neutral, and green technologies, the reality is that oil and natural gas remain a vital energy commodity. As of 2019, renewables made up only 10% of energy consumption, and based on the government's global projections, renewables aren't expected to be the top energy source until 2050. And even then, it's only expected to make up 28% of total energy consumption. So yeah, there's no doubt renewable energy is going to grow tremendously over the coming decades, but oil and natural gas will continue to grow to meet rising demand, albeit at a slower pace. And I think this is where Warren Buffett saw an opportunity. Here's XLE, the largest energy sector ETF. 
and 2020 provided an entry point to buy into the sector at a steep discount. And Chevron and Exxon, which are two vertically integrated oil majors that together make up nearly half the ETF, arguably provide the best broad exposure to the industry coming out of the pandemic. Now of the two, Chevron has a stronger balance sheet than Exxon and this has direct implications for their dividends. Here's why. The 5% dividend Chevron paid out cost $9.6 billion in cash in 2020. The problem is the company only generated $10.6 billion in cash from operations and spent $8.9 billion on capex to maintain its operations. So it took on $12.9 billion in debt to pay the dividend. But Exxon had it worse. It generated $14.7 billion in cash from operations, spent $17.3 billion in capex, and paid out $14.9 billion in dividends by issuing $23.2 billion in new debt. Its cash flow from operations wasn't enough to cover its capex spent or the dividend. Both companies have had to fall back on their balance sheets to operate their businesses at a loss as they waited for oil prices to recover. This is showing the debt to equity ratios for the two companies and ExxonMobil's ratio has increased dramatically the past year. Chevron's ratio has also increased but this was partly due to its $5 billion purchase of Noble Energy. This was a strategic move by the company to bolster its upstream portfolio assets and the acquisition is projected to save the company about $600 million by the end of this year. Looking beyond Exxon and compared to some of its other peers, Chevron still has the lowest net debt ratio of the group. Its balance sheet strength also gave it the wiggle room to increase its dividend in 2020 by 8.4% while its competitors raised it by less than half that or cut it drastically. At the current stock price, the company pays a 5% dividend and it's been paying for about 33 years, qualifying it as a dividend aristocrat. However, the company's ability to continue paying this out is heavily dependent on the direction of oil prices. If oil prices remain flat at $40 through 2025, it's going to have to continue taking on debt to maintain its dividend and capex with its net debt ratio peaking around 36%. If prices remain flat at $60, the company's projected more than $25 billion in excessive cash flow over five years. The good news is that right now, the Brent crude future is fluctuating close to $70, so it's basically recovered to pre-pandemic levels, and more importantly, global oil demand is expected to surge this year. Earlier this month, major banks were projecting Brent prices to reach $70 by year end. But Goldman Sachs recently revised their estimates and now predict oil to rise to $80 per barrel as demand for travel exceeds what existing supply is able to match. So based on these expectations, where does the company's valuation stand now? Well, Chevron stands at 7 multiple based on enterprise value to EBITDA. Exxon stands at 7.5. Total and BP stand at 5.3 and 4.6 respectively. But these two are cheap for a reason. Their debt to equity is much higher than even Exxon at 73% and 83%. Now the broader energy sector stands at a multiple of 8.3. And it might seem the Chevron is undervalued, but consider this. If you look at the historical EV to EBITDA prior to COVID, Chevron was valued at around eight. With oil prices now close to pre-pandemic levels, adjusting for its noble acquisitions and its 2021 growth prospects, I think the company is close to being fairly valued. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that like button down below and don't forget to hit that subscribe button and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.